Hi. I uh, hope you all had a great lunch. And um, I just want to introduce myself. My name is Haley Hughes, and I've been the IBM Design Language Lead for four years now. And I actually started at IBM about six years ago. And on my very first day, I noticed some things that were really strange. Uh, IBM had a really closed culture. Uh, as I experienced, uh, there were a lot of conversations happening behind closed doors, a lot of people working inside closed cubicles, and a lot of work being locked away in closed filing cabinets. And it was 2012, so <laughs> filing cabinets, really, IBM? Um, it was kind of a weird experience um, because uh, design at IBM was a foreign language and our open, collaborative culture and way of working had fallen to the wayside. Uh, so I was very fortunate when IBM decided to uh, make a transformation uh, and use design as the catalyst for that to uh, take part and work with some very close collaborators and uh, you know, subject matter experts that I'm excited to uh, invite here today to talk about our uh, past five years of design transformation. Uh, so today we'll be talking about three topics. Uh, the first one is uh, the actual uh, ways and means that we've transformed design at, uh, with design at IBM. Uh, the second one is about evolving the design language uh, itself and talking about how uh, we measure adoption and measure success for that. And then the last uh, chapter of this will be how we've created a design philosophy at IBM and how that's actually bred uh, and yielded a new design system. So uh, please join me in a very warm welcome. I'd like to invite uh, Petri Heskinen uh, up to the stage to kind of introduce the first chapter of IBM's design transformation. OK, everybody hearing? I have some friends here as well. So, but Let's start about the IBM transformation. So first of all, you need to understand it's a big entity. It's like a huge ship, and it's not only about the size of the company, which is Iceland-sized. It's also like uh, the legacy, the history. It was, it's an organization that is measured by the patents that they can come up and by the Nobel Prizes. So uh, the issue was that those, that company was almost in a crisis when they were selling the, they were selling features to CTOs and CIOs of the world. So no one cared about the poor sole user who needed to use those products. And with a transformation like this, you really need to support supporter from the higher up. So uh, in IBM cases, it was Gini Rometzi who's actually blessing the whole a uh, huge revolution, like, like the design revolution. And also, it's not only about the program, it's about the, uh, just like we said earlier, it's just about to uh, teach each and every uh, IBMer to think and feel and act like a designer. So it's more like, more than a tool or more than a method and more than a, a program. Uh, brief history lesson, so we, all know these uh, very <laughs> grand old designers, uh, Elliot Noyes, led by uh, Paul Rand, uh, Ray Eames and Charles Eames. So there was a history, there was a great legacy, a great artifact that they created, but it somehow faded when they started sell selling to CEOs and CTOs of the world those features. So the, until 2012, a uh, brave guy, Phil Gilbert started the ignition at the IBM, started to actually creating a program and creating a, a system that, that they can transform the huge ship that has been sailing in a way, sailing uh, to the crisis that they had. So once upon a time, 2012, uh, what was the stage at, the, uh, at that point about like the guidance? Everything was, when you land in J JFK, New York, you see those like big ass billboards and like really fine and polished advertising, uh, but the poor souls that need to use it, something like that. 
So all of the guidance and all of the energy and all of the leadership went into that, okay, let's build this polished image of the, our company and l let's not invest in the, what the user is actually wanting. Okay, now I will introduce the real heroes of this story. So like I mentioned, Phil Gilbert, the big guy, the big cowboy there, he handpicked the team, he handpicked uh, like the crew, the fine warriors who will uh, start steering this program and they drafted the first principles of that will direct the upcoming efforts. Uh, IBM basis is the, it's the three cornerstone of their transformation. People, places, practices. People about they are hiring uh, thousand designers and they are building the career paths for them and they are sort of like brainwashing <laughs> the middle management in the <laughs> uh, and they are putting huge huge amount of effort and investment also in the places, in the studios, where the actual the inv innovation is happening. And we are talking about the practices here. And talking these practices, IBM uses design language to, sp uh, to bring consistency within the uh, systems and services, what they are providing. They have uh, how they work. They have their own design thinking philosophy and tools and methods and they have their own research uh, practices. What happened within IBM, everything, we started with the design language and it needed to be fast. Phil Gilbert keeps saying that it's not about design thinking. Everybody is already like uh, fed up about design thinking this and design thinking that it's about outcomes. So we needed to act fast. And we came in as a, as a partner to you and we started to excavating what's, what is really IBM. And luckily we had like a good archives that, that they opened to us so we got like inspired and I influenced by their, their great, great minds and masters. And some of those inspiration was like, we took like pretty literally. So we t uh, when we created our motion design, so we, we took uh, inspiration from the machinery that they had built. Uh, in the beginning, we spent some time to actually let our hands do the thinking and just like explore uh, what is IBM, what is the appearance, what will be, and actually start converse, having a conversation with the designers, with the end users who will actually start using all of our components or, or code pieces that we are going to write. So that was like a... Uh, <sighs> crucial thing for us to have those like early adapters uh, be involved in the process because it's a huge organization and also using uh, like um, testing that the feasibility of our our thinking and, and our prototypes like really early on and, and fast. One very important part at that time was that we were speaking about language rather than ready-made sentences. So Adam Cutler, my client there, said that we are not hiring thousand designers to be copying machines. He was very adamant on the idea that the design system or the language what we are creating it needs to be very open and, and it needs to have abilities that people can uh, express themselves with it. Even though uh, started creating the guidelines and using this, maybe it's a cliched, uh, quote, but it was very important for me uh, to how how I bring scale from the tactical uh, tactical tasks to uh, a bit more holistic view. So, if I design a cup, uh, think of the bigger equation there. Think of the bigger entity: uh, a cup in a table, a table in a room, and a room in a building, and so on. So, if I have certain principles, I'm drawing the tiniest little piece here. And what happens if I scale those principles up? If, uh, uh, if I use the icon and then go into a component and from the component to a screen, uh, from a screen to an application and from application to line of application and then from there on you can start building a system that is open and it, uh, it has uh, the element of there is a room for expression. Obviously that when we chose to go the not that prescriptive mode or 
approach. It led to other issues that Haley will talk about more, and also like uh, like to pointing out that uh, how um, uh, Mike will show you how all of these disparities between marketing and branding and the product design will go on. Key moment, it wasn't like, it, I heard it, it was like conscious decision, but I assume that there have been lots of talk about doing it public, because movement needs to be public. And uh, I think it was a wise choice, not only like a publicity stunt, but as a promise for the public, uh, for the markets, for the clients, that we as an IBM, we will be a design-oriented company. And this is our way to do it, uh, show it fast to the public that, okay, we are taking a stance on, on the design as well. Now, what we achieved uh, within this phase was something that we respected the history, we respected the, what is IBM, and created a modern interpretation of, of the great era. And uh, these, these are just some numbers because I really value how IBM is truly open about how they say, uh, what, what, how is their transformation coming up. So they are talking about the ratio that w how many designers need to be per developers and, and so on. And, and they have uh, quickly grown up to a, a, a really big design organization and it's the, uh, it's getting results, results already. But it's not only numbers, it's also about that because the culture needs to be transformed as well. So they have created like rituals, they have created stories, they have created those heroes and symbols that drive and empower the culture, the design-driven cu culture. But talking about culture, I think it, now <laughs> it's uh, Haley's turn to talk about the, from the inside view of Thanks so much for chapter one, Petri. Yeah. Great. So um, as you can see, uh, as, as Petri mentioned, uh, you know, we really started and within about a year's time, we released our design language publicly to the world in 2014. And uh, we started to measure the success of the adoption through looking at the individual designer's adoption, as well as the adoption of the design language into the actual product offerings themselves. So today I'm gonna talk to you about some of the twists and turns in that adoption. Um, we used a lot of different research methods to evaluate and reach our large global design audience, uh, including things like email surveys, focus groups. Uh, we were shadowing designers, actually watching them uh, use the design language or actually try and build a product. Um, focus groups, like I mentioned, and active listening in our Slack channels, and doing kind of a competitive analysis. I, I think it, it was interesting to see, you know, we're, we're teams actually using things outside of IBM as well uh, to supplement. Um, and it really mattered to us whether the designers and their teams were uh, implementing uh, the libraries and things like that, but more importantly, uh, we were interested in understanding, you know, were they aware that the design language even existed? Uh, what were their perceptions about the design language? Um, you know, what were their needs and what were their behaviors? How were they, you know, actually practicing the thing that we were asking them to do? Uh, and so that helped us kind of establish a baseline for a healthy design language practice. Um, Ultimately, this was a framework that we used to measure the success more qualitatively, not just about you know, whether or not we could check in the code that they were using a component, um, but more so we asked ourselves these questions. Is it, is it better? Is our design language better than the current state of what came before it? Is it consistent in the values of the company and of our product design culture? Um, is it easy to use and understand? Is it uh, something that teams can actually experiment with? Can they break it and improve upon it? Uh, and are we seeing these teams being very successful in, in their adoption? 
So uh, the first one, these, you know, are we providing kind of relative advantages? Uh, I think for, for us, when we uh, did our research, we found that in particular, this was something that we were really good at. So we had a yes here, and I'll tell you a little bit why, about why. So 80% um, of our product teams had applied the design language within a year of its release. And this was across 15 different business units with thousands of products. Um, there wasn't any kind of corporate executive mandate. It was all kind of influence. So in terms of, you know, having a, a, a preference, this was a very popular choice for teams. Um, in addition to that, uh, I just want to kind of show you, this is, this is what we had before. So I guess uh, the benchmark wasn't too high. Um, it was essentially a, a pattern library. Um, and, and then, you know, this is the design language afterwards. And um, ultimately, uh, the thing that, you know, happened for us is that we um, were able to kind of move our teams from uh, really no design at all uh, to have and, and, uh, and one UI framework, so one coding framework, where designers could ultimately be cut out of the process altogether by development uh, to a more modern aesthetic uh, kind of fresh design approach uh, and allow developers to use any framework they needed to actually solve the problems that uh, they were facing, uh, as well as, you know, again, making it their own, making it open and flexible. So, you know, we would get feedback like this. This particular ritual was a healthy sign of the design adoption, right? Uh, there's not a day that goes by that, as a designer, I don't have this open on my desktop while I'm working. Um, now, at the same time, I want to be realistic. I always get such a crack out of this uh, because uh, one of our design uh, developers in the UK said that animation was an unnecessary faff. And to be honest, I have no idea what that means. <laughs> but it kind of sounds like an insult. Um, so ult ultimately, uh, it wasn't perfect. Um, but you know, our adoption was, uh, was relatively successful, and, and we definitely had um, ways to, to continue to improve. Uh, we got a lot of good feedback. So um, overall, the focus on these particular three things, on visual design, on user experience design, and on brand personality, really helped increase our internal um, reputation for design and our external reputation for design. Uh, Apple evangelist John Gruber uh, kind of said something I think that, that you know, he wasn't expecting, which was that uh, our design guidelines were elegant, thoughtful, uh, and, and great examples from IBM. And, and that really helped us kind of as a signal understand that this was better than what came before. <laughs> Um, the second question we asked ourselves is, is, is it consistent with existing values? Um, so this one was also positive. Um, uh, what was great uh, was that kind of we had a benchmark at IBM. We pride ourselves on being accessible, on being global, uh, again, global studios around the world, essential to the people that we're serving, um, expressive in our character and kind of how we show up, and experiential in the way that you engage with us. And so um, one of the things that really made our design language attractive was that uh, it was accessible from the very beginning. We baked all of our requirements into our guidelines, into our color palettes, and our code libraries, which just made it easier for uh, developers and designers to quickly adopt. Um, and we also wanted to make something that was a little bit more kind of grassroots and hands-on. And so we built this accessibility handbook as this quick reference guide for not only designers uh, and developers, but also product managers. So everyone on the team could understand their roles and responsibilities. In addition, um, another one of those uh, values at IBM is being global. And so uh, we had an approach to creating and testing our icons uh, that I think you might find interesting. So while we were creating our iconography, uh, we made these big test print sheets. And we would send them out to Singapore, to China, to Mexico, uh, Germany, without any labels written underneath the symbols. And we asked our designers in our global studios to print these out uh, really big and have not only the people in the studio, but also remote uh, uh, colleagues uh, come chime in and kind of write what they thought those symbols meant underneath the icons. It's 
pretty simple, but it was really powerful for us because it kind of challenged our biases about what we assumed our metaphors meant, educated us about the cultural context of the need, and we learned things like in the Middle East, for example, our you know eyeball icon, uh, a single eye alone could have a negative connotation. It could be seen as something evil or uh, contemptuous. So I think we learned quite a bit um, from this very lo-fi process. Um, another kind of value of IBMs that I think you know we definitely tried to embody was this idea of being essential. Um, and you know whether it's working on something you know kind of uh, like a mobile email client or something really exciting like a data visualization for the U.S. Open, uh, we tried to make sure that everything was really clean and organized and prioritized. And those essential qualities kind of show through the way that a user can inter interact or the way that kind of the, the visual system was set up. Um, for us, you know, being expressive uh, and, and, and kind of and showing the ways that uh, our character shows up was another kind of thing that we looked for evidence for. And so uh, we would see in these little kind of snippets and, and uh, mood boards how, you know, whether we're working on something for weather data, uh, data visualizations, or uh, to scale like large e-commerce platforms and different kind of day-to-day -day management tools that we were expressing in a, in a really bold new way. This was something that, you know, you just didn't see something like this at IBM before. I think Petri kind of showed you where we were at. It was more like a Craigslist ad. Um, and really what you saw was us delivering on that promise uh, that, you know, Thomas J. Watson, our CEO in the 1970s had that design, good design is good business uh, across everything. Uh, particularly for us, it was about the people that were using our products. Lastly, we wanted things to feel experiential. We wanted people to discover and interact and engage in ways that excited them and actually led them to an insight. Uh, so one case study that really highlights this is the creation of custom data visualization guidelines. This came out of a specific need from our teams because IBM designers, they work on software that touches healthcare, finance, uh, retail, and climate behavior, all kinds of really important, complicated problems. Um, and the issue is that they need ways to represent uh, really big, large data sets in interactive ways that help lead subject matter experts to new ideas. Um, and so instead of kind of having, you know, the end user pour through reports or messy data tables, um, you know, we wanted them to be able to do things like compare different data sets, to overlay data sets on top of each other, to be able to zoom in and zoom out, uh, to kind of sort out and understand information. And so uh, we took inspiration from some poster art, actually, uh, and the natural world to help develop uh, this unique flower chart diagram and several others uh, that look and feel like IBM. Uh, and they're also innovative and useful ways to uh, explore certain data sets. And coming up with new ways of seeing, uh, we also asked ourselves questions like, how, how does IBM represent the future with data? Uh, these are just some kind of early sketches of that. And we were exploring things like texture, layers, different patterns that could elegantly represent something like a forecast. Um, we looked at different symbols uh, and things that could indicate you know, predictive strength or the likelihood in a forecast that something might actually happen. And then we started working with the actual product teams themselves on kind of these interactive prototypes and, and actually getting into the code um, how, you know, the experience of even an existing product could be more dynamic uh, using the constraints of static charts like a line chart here uh, that users were already familiar with. So. Um, the next adoption metric was complexity. Uh, so is the system easy for people to understand and use? Uh, for us, this was probably one of our biggest weaknesses. Uh, and the reason I say that is because in that year, we built one self-service website, and we had all of these early career designers, and they you know, had to do a lot of self-instruction. 
Uh, the design language was so open to interpretation that it felt like a bunch of guidelines that were kind of being thrown at them from an ivory tower uh, without the really important infrastructure that was actually needed to build trust with the individual designers and with the community. Um, so once we launched it, I was actually the only person responding to all of the needs and all of the requests, and I'm sure, as you understand, that was pretty overwhelming. Um, if you've never heard of it, uh, being at IBM at that time and working on the design language was similar to something called Conway's Law, which is that any organization which designs a system or a language will end up producing a design whose structure is a copy of the organization's communication structure. And let me show you how that looks. So here's the way that IBM software groups were organized in 2016. And this is an image of a website that we had to build to keep track of all of the guidelines and systems that were being created within IBM after we launched the design language. So once we put something out there, everybody within IBM thought that they needed to build one too to fill in the gaps. Um, I'm sure you heard a little bit about that this morning from some of our other um, talks, and it happened to us too. Uh, now, what that actually meant to the business was that there were 23 full-time designers and developers uh, working on six different component libraries that were coding the same drop-downs, the same radio buttons, over and over again. Now, they all knew each other existed, but they weren't collaborating, and that was costing IBM over $3 million year over year. It was very expensive, and we had to do a lot of phone calls, as Nathan mentioned earlier, uh, to start actually bringing those teams together, which is what I've been working on over the past year. The next uh, metric for adoption was this idea of trialability. Can teams actually experiment with it? Uh, for us, because our focus on the first design language was really about design, you could tell that it really served the designer, um, but less so the developer. Uh, designers were able to experiment, as I mentioned. They were building all of these different sets of guides to help them with their unique industries and users. Um, but some things I think might be valuable for you all uh, are, were that, you know, for example, when you see these you know, teams working on these uh, different uh, guidelines or systems within your company uh, and you want to bring them together, uh, you can, again, do this in a really kind of low-fidelity, human-centered way. Uh, we actually created a kind of science fair, <laughs> the science fair of design guides, and we asked teams to come together and kind of do a panel, sharing out their ideas, and then um, doing you know, the work itself, um, uh, kind of learning from each other. In addition, when we launched the design language, it's really hard for me in particular to find the actual results of the work. Like, when they actually applied the design language, um, they didn't share back. And that was part of a, a cultural problem of kind of a fear and intimidation of putting their work up and a vulnerability of what kind of feedback they would get back. So we started instigating critique in a lot of different ways, some of them in person, but we also uh, kind of acquire, um, bought this third-party uh, tool licenses called Wake, uh, and we use this and teams from all those different 16 business units that you saw, they have their own spaces in Wake, but they're intentionally open by design so that other business units and other teams can see what they're doing. Um, that's been really actually valuable, and you're seeing cross-pollination across teams and critique. Uh, it's kind of really valuable to those teams. Uh, again, like I mentioned, we had some drawbacks. For example, you know, we didn't have enough code examples, and we didn't have enough infrastructure for our development community, and they told us so. Um, so we definitely have had to work on that since. Uh, lastly, observability. Do you see others practice with success? Um, so we did. We saw, you know, again, a lot of people using the design language, not necessarily going out and using material or, you know, Salesforce Lightning or anything else. They were, they were sticking to what we were offering them and filling in the gaps. But if you went to IBM.com, this is kind of what you saw. <laughs> I mean, it's better design than the past, but it still looks like the Wild West. It almost looks like IBM as one company is 15. Um, and part of the problem that we were facing was actually that we didn't have enough craftspeople. Uh, at IBM, we have a ratio right now with designers that we have about 1,600, but there's 
twice as many user experience designers as there were visual and front-end development. And so this is kind of a number that we were able to point out and help our leadership um, be aware of so that we could work on fixing it. Um, another issue is that design is embedded within the culture of IBM and within our different corporate functions. So designers work in human resources. They sometimes work with legal teams. They work you know, in product and in marketing and brand especially. But the design is too distributed and all over the place. And on top of that, because we hired so many early career designers straight out of college, we have a really small pool of design leadership. They're very talented, but there's a ripple effect that happens when they have to you know, influence the design community, the content creators, anyone who's creative at IBM, as well as influence you know, everyone to think and work like a designer, and also the perception of the end users who are using anything or engaging with IBM. So we have kind of an issue that we need to solve around the lack of leadership um, one thing that you guys may be familiar with, and this is something that we continuously struggle with, is this idea of kind of experience versus the how much constraint you put into the guidelines and into the system itself. We have, you know, uh, the designers, and then we have the rest of IBM. And the designers have a certain skill level, and we want to be more open. Uh, but with, you know, all of IBM that we're trying to serve, better, you know, their keynote PowerPoints or their ev event, uh, you know, presentations, we always uh, want to make sure that everyone has a chance to be a better kind of design craftsperson. And so we're kind of balancing the needs between skill level and the amount of guidance we provide. Um, overall, I think that for anyone that's trying to measure the adoption of a design language quantitatively and qualitatively, the one thing most important to keep in mind is that nothing is invented and perfected at the same time. Um, but I, I want to say that through all of the insights that we had, one thing that was most critical was that we really wanted to unite our design community around a common philosophy and a common design ethos. We knew that that was a great place to start if we could help bring the mindset into the culture. So last but not least, I'd like to talk about chapter three and invite our creative director from New York, Micah Vink, up to really talk about that design philosophy. <clears throat> wow, thanks Haley, Petri, amazing work. Um, Great insights, and um, boy, have they made change uh, at IBM. Um, uh, I joined IBM three years ago uh, on, the, on a newly formed team, uh, the brand experience and design team uh, out of New York. Uh, and prior to that, there was no brand experience team within IBM. It was always outsourced. So here we were, a new team, um, and immediately tasked with looking across the brand and starting to design um, you know, updates to the Watson brand, uh, cloud team, um, uh, working with events, global events, corporate events. Um, and it took us, you know, a year and a half of tinkering around and getting to know the brand ourselves as a team and also connecting with Haley on stuff and starting to learn the rest of IBM, um, the machine of design at IBM, uh, and also as they were growing and building design language. Um, so we quickly came to the same realization that IBM needed a design system that would work across the brand, not just for product or digital, but everywhere and for everything designed. So even if you were building a house uh, under the, the brand name of IBM, how would you go about doing that? What, what, what is the system that we could tap into that would be very similar to the system that a, a visual designer would use to build an app? So what is that system? We kept thinking over and over, how do we get to something so big um, and so complex for such a giant monster like IBM? Um, we also then realized that before we could do something like that, we needed to understand um, IBM's design point of view. What is that? Um, and right, you know, right now, if you were to ask Phil Gilbert, what is your point of view on design, he would give you an answer. But if you ask Ginny Rometty what her point of view was, or if you asked me, or Haley, Petri, we would all have different answers. So we knew we had to get to a unified point of view about what IBM thought our role was uh, when it came to design. What, what did we think design should do? Um, and what was our point of view there? 
So let's get into that. Um, so yeah, so we spent better part of the last year, I think, getting around this idea of crystallizing our point of view. Our, our, what's our philosophy around design? Uh, we need to get to an overarching philosophy, an under, underlying set of principles that govern and guide everything designed at IBM. A system of thought, and like our business, a system deliberately designed to grow and extend um, and evolve with how the business grows and evolves, right? Um, so if you look on the right side here, that's kind of where we are about now. <laughs> uh, great intentions, but we're aimed in a lot of different places. A lot of people operate still in silos or, uh, uh, to, as Haley demonstrated, even with a design language that's kind of pretty open, but there's enough there to do things. Um, in a particular way, but if you have a different set of goals, you don't have the right talent on the team, it's going to splinter. Um, and so that's happening everywhere, not just in product and digital. We got to get to something that looks a lot more like the left side here, a little more controlled, curated, something that's a bit more unified. Um, so this is a great quote that we found. Again, we're always looking back at the old, the old gray hair guys, uh, the old dead white men from the 50s and 60s. <laughs> Um, but, you know, they, they, they define des modern design as we know it, so we have to go look at the root of what those guys are always trying to un uncover, right? Um, so here's a great quote. So, without aesthetic, design is either the humdrum repetition of familiar cliches or a wild scramble for novelty. Without aesthetic, the computer is but a mindless sp speed machine producing effects without substance, Form without relevant content or content without meaningful form. Wow. I think he, he's talking about this. <laughs> that's, that's why we're here, because we, we don't have that kind of that, that set of principles that guide us around what we think design is. Um, it's purpose. Um, so yes, so how do we get to a design philosophy first? Um, and how is that going to then affect a design system? You can't do it the other way around. You have to know what you believe in and stand for and what your, what, what your principles are to get to what you think a design system might then express. So philosophy then leads to uh, um, principles. Principles that, of course, can't just be any old principles and reflecting just design. Um, it all has to ladder back up to the brand, right? So the principles that connect design and content to the brand, because that's how you express that brand, right? It's not just some design look and feely stuff. It's got to come through the content, the stories you tell. Um, and that ultimately ref reflects the brand's character. So then once you get to some character and start to figure out, you know, what that is, which we have plenty of, that's the brand, right? We, IBM knows certainly how to talk about the brand, you know, or about progress, or about essential. Uh, we've got that all packaged up very well, but what we haven't packaged is, well then, if we're this, then therefore we think design should do this. Um, and of course, an aesthetic comes out of that, and that's what's missing, right? That's why you see all these desperate parts, and people are desperately carving out what their aesthetic might be, with, even within a design, you know, a, a loosely played out design language you'll start to already see how it splinters that because people are like, I think people are dying to have that kind of direction when it's not there. Um, so another great quote from another dead uh, white guy, sorry, but it's so good. This, this is my favorite quote of the whole, of the whole deck. Um, a corporation should be like a painting. Everything visible should contribute to the correct total statement. That's awesome. Um, and that's exactly what brands are and corporate identities and why we have languages and all this kind of jazz, right? We're trying to kind of make everything that we do contribute to the correct totality of what the organization stands for and believes in. Um, and again, the dead white guys really did a lot of thinking around this, right? They, and and, and they, had it, they had it made, right? They had a handful of products um, they handpicked an awesome team, you know, you had the Eames and uh, Elliot Noyes led this team and handpicked all of his mates, right? They were at the, the beginning of this kind of modernist, uh, they were connected into the zeitgeist, Serenin, uh, which you guys know well. Um, they built that, right? So they, they had great control, great um, uh, ideas around design, they defined it. Um, we don't have that luxury anymore because we make thousands of things. Um, 
have thousands of users. So crystallizing our design philosophy, a uniquely IBM design philosophy, right? So we can come up with lots of philosophies, but what makes it IBM? I don't know. It's, it's, we argue about it a lot still. It's still this work in progress, by the way. Um, but if you can get to that, it's going to give everyone purpose, right? Because when everyone believes in something, it gives you great purpose. That's why we have movements, uh, things like that. Wars, <laughs> for Christ's sakes. You've got to have purpose, man. Um, and again, when you have all of these things, principles, beliefs, and purpose, there's an outcome to that. Uh, especially when, in, when we're talking visual design and expression and, and content, you're going to get to the aesthetic. And that becomes yours, right? That becomes the way you show up. Um, and you do that across all the things you design, not just digital, not just product, not just corporate identity stuff or events, all of it. Um, that's when it has impact. And the one thing we knew we had to do as well is this philosophy, um, it had to be big, right? It had to be as big as IBM is. It had to represent futuristic kind of ideas of where we're trying to, you know, take the business as well. So the idea had to be big enough to evolve. Um, it's got to be a simple idea, um, and it has to be true. It has to be true and authentic to IBM and what we believe in as a brand. Um, so we've got some constant themes that have always been with IBM since its beginning, right? Since we, we have this kind of theme of um, mankind and machine. We've always done it since the, like the first meat slicer we made to um, the punched card. Um, it doesn't matter how big these things are, small these things are. They always kind of help people kind of transform, and, um, but it's about the machine uh, and how we deal with that. Look at these big mothers. I mean, <laughs> oh, man, I look at that image and just think how happy I am that I'm not working in there, um, as cool as it may be. But again, man and machine. Man and machine, it's an interesting topic. Uh, we, we even use that topic in all of our advertising uh, in the 80s. Um, this is an awesome ad. This whole campaign was pretty cool. If you haven't seen it, go Google it. Um, the Charlie Chaplin IBM ads, they're awesome. Um, even today, it's about man and machine. Here's our quantum computer, hand-built by the research team in New York. Most of the parts are built on site. They have machine shops. Uh, everything is pretty much there. The chips are there. Like we make everything at, at the research center. Very few things came from outside. Um, so man and machine. Here Alex DeKid wrote a hit song. I think it made it into the top three with Watson, our artificial intelligence um, technology. That's weird, isn't it? Like he and some Watson character sitting in a room making a, a, a hit song. Anyway, it's, it's at the root of IBM, man and machine. The other uh, very important thing that we've always been doing, again, since the time began, <laughs> is teaching, learning, and research. We've always taught, that's throughout our history, we're actually even very, very known for that. Um, today, we've uh, got a great program called, P um, uh, what's it called? Uh, uh, P-TECH. P-TECH, yeah. Uh, I was going to say it when I was like, oh, that's wrong. But no, P-TECH, thanks. Um, we've coupled with um, New York City education system and the New York State education system. And we've built together with them a program that takes high school kids through high school, through college, and then helps place them. And so it's a long-term program, right, because that takes time to get through high school, college, and then get, finally get a friggin' job. Um, but we're actually starting to place people, and if, if some of the early P-Techers are now actually working at IBM and, of course, other places. Um, the other biggie for us is building um, partnerships. We've done it with NASA early days, uh, with the Apollo mission, um, all the way to pretty much present day where we uh, have great partnerships with Apple and um, many, many, many others. It's how we basically do business, right? Um, it's how we achieve progress, right? One of our brand uh, goals. Um, we do progress through partnership. We can't do it alone. Um, and that's how you build relationships. Um, and relationships, like Paul Rand has a great quote. He thinks 
Um, he, well, he talks a lot about how um, design is the study of relationships, right? It's investigating and looking at these relationships, and that's how you design. Um, well, that, we've designed our business by doing that. Um, we've always been about moving people from here to there, no matter how small or large that task is. Uh, it can be from day to day, working stuff, all the way to entire like, transformations uh, with our partners. So what's our design philosophy then? We've narrowed it down. Again, work in progress. We're always noodling on stuff, but we think it's about this idea of guiding uh, because we've, we're always participating in guiding people to success, to um, progress, um, learning, um, innovation, and building things. Uh, we're at the center of that, uh, not by ourselves, but again, through these relationships and partnerships. So we've been calling this idea duo, right? Because it's like, a du there's, you know, togetherness is always better than singleness. Uh, you know, doing it better together. Uh, we love this idea of duo. It talks about dancing. It talks about relationships. Um, but you do that through guiding. You, you, so design is about guiding people through experiences. So duo is an idea, and it becomes an ideal for us about um, how we do design, you know, and we're a services company and a lot of services that succeed basically do a great job being guides. Um, I always liken it to, um, I'm a big fan of Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, I'm always uh, getting um, involved with uh, getting tours wherever I travel and there's a Frank Lloyd Wright house I can check out. And time and time again, I don't know how these guys do it, but somehow the docents that walk me through the house tour are amazing, right? They, they, they know everything about Frank Lloyd Wright. They know everything about the house. Um, and as they're walking you through the house, they, they might, you might be in the bedroom and they'll point to a book and they'll talk about how that book was given to Frank Lloyd Wright or, or the people who own the house uh, by like Pablo Picasso or whatever. Um, oh, and that bedspread was made by, you know, uh, uh, such and such and such. So they have all these little anecdotes and sidelines. And, you just feel like you're part of a story. Um, and so we, we've been talking a lot about how a, a great docent is kind of a great example for us as, uh, as uh, designers. How do we lead people and be great docents through any experience, whether it's coming to a conference that we're involved with and getting the badge when you first arrive to signing up uh, an account on Bluemix and starting to build? What is that guidance and how do we do a great job of making the user feel like, wow, this is awesome. Um, so we've always been about thinking. Um, we've had this you know, phrase, think, since the 20s, I think, um, if not earlier. Um, and it's, I think, why design thinking fits so nicely into IBM. Um, and now we have this idea around, well, if we think like this and our brand means this and that, um, we think design is about guiding. Um, so I think this is gonna help us, right? It brings kind of uh, the brand, the philosophy and principles together, um, and they should inform basically the creation of this, e this giant design system I kind of talked about that we need to have to kind of bind everything together. Um, and that philosophy needs to be kind of embedded into everything um, from the beginning to the end. So again, design philosophy first, then go make a design system. We realize that by getting to this kind of idea of guide that we have to kind of build some things from the ground up again. Um, we've got a great platform um, that Haley and Petri walked you through now that we, that we can kind of snap onto, right? They laid down some great groundwork for now to then take this idea of being a guide and now kind of leveling up our whole um, design experience uh, capability. Because um, it's kind of born from an idea now that we can get behind, I think. And, and now it's unifying us all at IBM because now we're taking this and making sure everyone kind of snaps into this. Everyone hopefully believes in it and does, doesn't keep arguing with us about it. Um, but I think at one point we're all going to fall in line. And, and, and again, for the first time probably in our, since the old dead guys, um, feel like we're kind of unified as one, one business around what does design do? Um, so again, guide people towards progress by putting fundamentals into a design practice. Um, this quote you saw, but it's a great one. Um, Petri showed it as well, um, but it's, it's awesome. It's, I think it, it kind of, that's why you probably keep seeing it, because um, it's so good. Um, but we realized also that, you know, 
part of making great design is not just kind of thinking it through and coming up with an idea and then, you know, laying down some parts. It, you've got to be experts at all of this stuff, right? And there's so many disciplines involved. Um, which brings me to this concept that I'm going to kind of inject into this talk, this notion of slow design. Um, you guys have probably all heard of the slow food movement, right? Farm to table. Um, everyone's doing organic now. It's huge, right? It's affected all these other design disciplines, um, except digital design. <laughs> so there's slow furniture design, right? There's slow fashion. Everyone's kind of into hand looming again and knitting and um, connecting to tribes around the world or cultures around the world, getting um, folks who kind of have all these, you know, craft skills, and they're bringing that into kind of products and everyday use and making that affordable again, and it's kind of reviving this whole craft scene. There's slow journalism, which I love, and it's a reaction against what they've been calling uh, a journalism, uh, where the news media like CNN, I'll call them out because I hate them, um, they just churn out stuff over and over and it's repetition, repetition. It's not about like thorough craft of writing and research and telling a story. That's like forgotten. So slow journalism is about getting back into that. There's even a guy who's uh, produced the new magazine who's kind of, I think he's one of the guys who spearheaded this whole slow journalism thing. The magazine is about, um, I can't remember what the magazine is about, but the, go the goal for the writers is that the, every article in this magazine has 90 days um, to achieve the article. So that's a lot of time to do your research, travel, investigate, um, interview, and write your article. That's amazing. That that is what they've dedicated their content to. Like, we're going to do it right. Um, slow architecture, another amazing uh, uh, things that I've seen pop up there. To, uh, I'll show you an image, actually, be better than me babbling. But, you know, slow fashion's huge now. Um, there's hand dyeing, you know, using natural dyes. There's uh, uh, reclaimed uh, um, materials. Like I just recently, looking for an image, I saw, saw that someone reclaimed uh, down jackets, you know, the puffer coat, and they're making scarves. <laughs> it looked ridiculous, but um, it's a great idea. <laughs> Anyway, so here's a guy, I know this guy, uh, Stephen Burke, he's amazing, but he's, uh, he, he went traveling to Africa and, he, and he, uh, he, he found so many craftspeople making baskets and doing all kinds of this amazing stuff. He started to design um, furniture and tapping into those folks, but kind of art directing them, giving them new materials to, to rethink um, their craft. And then he's pitched this stuff to basically like Casina and B&B uh, &B Italia and all, all these like amazing Italian brands have this guy's furniture and um, he's been uh, working with these craftspeople and they get paid. Um, they get to kind of re re resuscitate their uh, craft uh, and, and spin a new kind of, I think, uh, way of thinking around it. The slow architecture, they're using an old Japanese um, uh, technique of like burning or, or, or uh, yeah torching the wood so that it seals the wood um, and weatherproofs it and it's an ancient technique but they're using it now and building you know look at this house I, I wish I was there right now actually um, anyway slow digital design what would that mean for us how would we change the way we work to kind of tap into not just being slower it's not about that uh, in theory but what else can we look at to, to get inspiration that, we're, that, to, that would lead us to doing something different? All these other d design disciplines are doing it, um, and I don't think we're doing it. So we're kind of the last um, that could fit into that, if we even do. Um, I pose it as a question. Why not? What would it mean for us? Um, but in thinking about this, I looked at IBM Research um, recently and a lot of what that I got a tour there as well and they practice it I mean these guys they have months and months to invent and research and do stuff um, like I said earlier they they built the the quantum computer on site <laughs> you know? and actually this is a good side uh, note as well um, they they uh, they they wanted to counter the the vibrations of the building that it was sitting in that they um, they drilled holes in the two stories to get to the earth and so the the computer is actually on the second floor but it's actually floating on the dirt through the floors um, so they could reduce vibration so they do stuff like that 
Anyway, um, I'll skip that. Um, getting back to basics, um, essential elements, you guys know all this, but uh, the way I've been thinking about this new system moving forward is like Lego blocks, right? If you can, if you can design the hell and engineer the hell out of the, the parts that you need to use, like Lego blocks have, build them on a, a, a kind of an infrastructure that guides all of the parts, right, like Lego blocks, and then engineer and, and craft the hell out of each part, um, you basically get to what Lego blocks have done, which has not changed for many, many years. They're so damn good. It's so basic. It's so simple. It answers lots of simple questions. But what the hell? You know, you can still create endless and infinite possibilities with such, with like 12 basic parts. Um, like this little kid's ad, like uh, what it is is beautiful. Um, so what, what can we make beautiful out of a, set of parts that has been so well designed. That's what, we're, that's what our goal is. What it does is it allows people to focus on creativity uh, and innovation and the content, again, the key to, to kind of expressing a brand, content, uh, so we can focus on um, you know, uh, meaningful uh, uh, experiences and not reinventing the parts, right? Why would we reinvent Lego blocks? They're perfect. Um, so how do we get there? And it also, once you have that uh, great system, it's easy to use, it's scalable, it's definitely efficient, which Haley pointed out, everyone's already like spending, what did you say, 3.2 million uh, of wasted dollars because they're reinventing Lego blocks. Um, uh, it's all gotta fit together. Uh, again, we're after the unity, not necessarily uniformity. We still want creativity there, but like Lego blocks, which that's unity and uniformity, like it's predetermined set of things, but look how creative you can be. Um, so I'm going to move fast now because I'm running out of time. So you guys know all this stuff. You need some basic foundational elements to any visual system. Um, typeface, grid, typography, color, icons. Um, there's motion and components. Uh, there's a lot of talk about how we're missing typography skills these days. Uh, and an interface is primarily a typographic experience. How many people involved that, that you know build uh, digital experiences are experts in typography? Anyone? Who's an expert in typography? Very few hands. <laughs> exactly. But typography is in every friggin' digital experience that you've ever touched. And we have almost zero typography experts. So let's dial that up. Um, so what we did to try to get kind of a movement there, and it's kind of, um, I don't know, focus, we, d we designed our own typeface. Um, built around some of these themes I've been talking to you about, man and machine. We've made it open source to kind of so it's out there for people. It's about building relationships. Um, you know, natural engineered. We're calling it Plex. It's uh, available. Uh, you can go to GitHub and download the whole damn thing. Use it as you wish. We've got a sans serif, a monospace, and a serif. Eight weights. Building out all these crazy languages. Um, we're truly making it global. Here's our first kind of draft at Arabic. There's Hebrew underway, Greek, um, but you need to have a grid to kind of put great typography in. Uh, we've got a grid system, just like Lego blocks. We're using pixels for Christ's sakes. We're not rethinking what our material could be or anything else. There's pixels, let's use them, let's build a grid system on that. It's also based on units of twos, and everything we make fits on the grid. Um, there's a little glimpse of it. Here's a little animation. So here's just gives you an idea. There's little pixels under there, underneath there. I'm not sure you can see them. But no matter what we make, it's kind of just snapping on the, the grid, just like Lego blocks. All of our spacers. Um, so basically all the tools and the useful things you need to build th uh, digital experiences with, we're, 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 we are going to standardize that um, and c very carefully. Even the proportions we're locking down on snap and work on the grid. Um, Typography, we're improving. Um, we go back. We're gonna, you know, um, we're giving it, um, you know, all of the infrastructure underneath it to do good, uh, practice good typography. We're trying to capture that and uh, teach that to young designers. So doing the correct kind of, uh, this is a big note. I'm going to double down on this because no one knows this. This is wrong. That is right. Wrong. Right. Um, 
have a point of view um, on typography. So we're, we're double downing on flush left. We're no, none of this centered, flush right, mixing it all up business. No, we are f about flush left. Done. No more conversation about that. Color. Let's have a point of view. We're big blue. We've always owned blue. Blue is essential, which is our other brand kind of uh, attribute. Um, it's the sky. It's the water. It's blue jeans, which goes with everything. Um, and we're going to give color a job. But at our core, we're blue. Um, but we also have other colors. We've reduced some. But we're left with colors. Um, we've, we've made them vibrant. And we also have a little tone of blue in everything. So there's blue in every single color there. It binds them. It creates a relationship between them. Um, and we're giving it a job. Um, the blue is about guiding. So whenever you see blue in a future IBM product, it's probably telling you to do something or guiding you through something. Icons. We built them on a grid as well. They relate to the typeface. Um, there they are. Anyway, I'll skip through that. Everyone knows what icons are, but um, ours are special, more special than anyone else's. <laughs> um, natural, we've got, again, ideas of man and machine in there, and I've got to get through some of this. Um, I'm at zero seconds. Some cool motion stuff. <laughs> One last thing and then I'll, I'll shut up. What else? More. Uh, One final statement. Um, that's all digital stuff, but we've also, again, applied to all of the stuff I've been yammering about. It's not just about digital, it's about words as well. This used to be powered by Watson, which is what everyone uses, right? But we're about guiding people and relationships. Mm. Um, it's now called with Watson. So it, it, nice. the, the idea goes not just through all the design stuff, but it's about our, crafting our words as well. Imagery, brands, everything. Hey, Mike, thank you very, very much.